Part Introduction Systems planning is the first of five phases in the system's development life cycle. It's always a good idea to know whether a project fits the company's overall strategy. A systems project that does not align with corporate strategies should not be approved. The role of an information system is to support business goals. Chapter 1 focuses on an introduction to systems analysis and design by describing the role of information technology in today's dynamic business environment. This includes information systems, internet business strategies, modeling business operations, business information systems, organizational information models, systems development, the information technology department, and the role of the systems analyst. Chapter 2 focuses on analyzing the business case explains how systems projects get started, and describes how to evaluate a project proposal to determine its feasibility. This includes strategic planning and strategic planning tools, the business case, systems requests, factors affecting systems projects, processing systems requests, assessing request feasibility, setting priorities, and the preliminary investigation. Chapter 3 focuses on managing systems projects. This includes an overview of project management, creating a work breakdown structure, task patterns, the critical path, project monitoring and control, reporting, project management software, risk management, and managing for success. Chapter Introduction Chapter 12 describes system support and security tasks that continue throughout the useful life of the system. The system support and security phase begins when a system becomes operational and continues until the system reaches the end of its useful life. Throughout the development process, the objective has been to create an information system that is efficient, easy to use, and affordable. After delivering the system, the IT team focuses on support and maintenance tasks. Managing system support and security involves three main concerns, user expectations, system performance, and security requirements. The chapter includes three case and point discussion questions to help contextualize the concepts described in the text. There are two question of ethics scenarios in this chapter. The first scenario concerns known security vulnerabilities in a system and what should be done about them. The second scenario is about divulging personal information, social media, and free speech. Learning Objectives When you finish this chapter, you should be able to 1. Describe user support activities. 2. Define the four types of maintenance. 3. Explain seven strategies and techniques for maintenance management. 4. Describe techniques for system performance management. 5. Explain system security concepts and common attacks against the system. 6. Explain three tasks related to risk management concepts. 7. Assess system security at six levels, physical security, network security, application security, file security, user security, and procedural security. 8. Describe backup and disaster recovery. 9. List six factors indicating that a system has reached the end of its useful life. 10. List future challenges and opportunities for IT professionals. User Support A systems analyst is like an internal consultant who provides guidance, support, and training. Successful systems often need the most support because users want to learn the features, try all the capabilities, and discover how the system can help them perform their tasks. In most organizations, more than half of all IT department effort goes into supporting existing systems. Companies provide user support in many forms, including user training and a help desk to provide technical support and assistance. This help can be provided in-house or outsourced.
User Training Chapter 11 Describe the initial training that is performed when a new system is introduced. Additionally, new employees must be trained on the company's information systems. If significant changes take place in the existing system or if a new version is released, the IT department might develop a user training package. Depending on the nature of the changes, the package could include online support via email, a special website, a revision to the user guide, a training manual supplement, or formal training sessions. Training users about system changes is similar to initial training. The main objective is to show users how the system can help them perform their jobs. Help Desks As systems become more complex, users need constant support and guidance. To make data more accessible and to empower users, many IT departments create help desks. A help desk, also called a service desk, is a centralized resource staffed by IT professionals who provide users with the support they need to do their jobs. A help desk has three main objectives. Parenthesis, one, in parenthesis. Show people how to use system resources more effectively. Parenthesis, two, in parenthesis. Provide answers to technical or operational questions, and. Parenthesis, three, in parenthesis. Make users more productive by teaching them how to meet their own information needs. A help desk is the first place users turn when they need information or assistance. A help desk does not replace traditional IT maintenance and support activities. Instead, help desks enhance productivity and improve utilization of a company's information resources. Help desk representatives need strong interpersonal and technical skills plus a solid understanding of the business because they interact with users in many departments. A help desk should document carefully all inquiries, support tasks, and activity levels. The information can identify trends and common problems and can help build a technical support knowledge base. A help desk can boost its productivity by using remote control software, which allows IT staff to take over a user's workstation and provide support and troubleshooting. One example of such a software application is GoToMyPC by Citrix, shown in Figure 12-1. During a typical day, the help desk staff members might have to perform the following tasks. Show a user how to create a data query or report that displays specific business information. Resolve network access or password problems. Demonstrate an advanced feature of a system or a commercial package. Help a user recover damaged data. Offer tips for better operation. Explain an undocumented software feature. Show a user how to use web conferencing. Explain how to access the company's intranet or the internet. Assist a user in developing a simple database to track time spent on various projects. Answer questions about software licensing and upgrades. Provide information about system specifications and the cost of new hardware or software. Recommend a system solution that integrates data from different locations to solve a business problem. Provide hardware support by installing or reconfiguring devices such as scanners, printers, network cards, wireless devices, optical drives, backup devices, and multimedia systems. Show users how to maintain data consistency and integrity among a desktop computer, a notebook computer, and a handheld computer or smartphone. Troubleshoot software issues via remote control utilities. In addition to functioning as a valuable link between IT staff and users, the help desk is a central contact point for all IT maintenance activities. The help desk is where users report system problems, ask for maintenance, or submit new systems requests. A help desk can utilize many types of automated support, just as outside vendors do, including email responses, on-demand fax capability, an online knowledge base, frequently asked questions, FAQs, discussion groups, bulletin boards and automated voicemail. Many vendors now provide a live chat feature for online visitors. Outsourcing Issues As discussed in Chapter 7, many firms outsource various aspects of application development. This trend also includes outsourcing IT support and help desks. 
As with most business decisions, outsourcing has pros and cons. Typically, the main reason for outsourcing is cost reduction. Offshore call centers can trim expenses and free up valuable human resources for product development. However, firms have learned that if tech support quality goes down, customers are likely to notice and might shop elsewhere. Critical factors might include phone wait times, support staff performance, and online support tools. The real question is whether a company can achieve the desired savings without endangering its reputation and customer base. Risks can be limited but only if a firm takes an active role in managing and monitoring support quality and consistency. Maintenance Tasks The system support and security phase is an important component of total cost of ownership, TCO, because ongoing maintenance expenses can determine the economic life of a system. Figure 12-2 shows a typical pattern of operational and maintenance expenses during the useful life of a system. Operational costs include items such as supplies, equipment rental, and software leases. Note that the lower area shown in Figure 12-2 represents fixed operational expenses, while the upper area represents maintenance expenses. Maintenance expenses vary significantly during the system's operational life and include spending to support maintenance activities. Maintenance activities include changing programs, procedures, or documentation to ensure correct system performance, adapting the system to changing requirements, and making the system operate more efficiently. Those needs are met by different types of maintenance. Types of maintenance. Although some overlap exists, four types of maintenance tasks can be identified, as shown by the examples in Figure 12 3. Corrective maintenance is performed to fix errors, adaptive maintenance adds new capability and enhancements, perfective maintenance improves efficiency, and preventive maintenance reduces the possibility of future system failure. Some analysts use the term maintenance to describe only corrective maintenance that fixes problems. It is helpful, however, to view the maintenance concept more broadly and identify the different types of tasks. Figure 12-3 Examples of Maintenance Tasks Corrective maintenance fixes errors and problems. Adaptive maintenance provides enhancements to a system. Perfective maintenance improves a system's efficiency, reliability, or maintainability. Preventive maintenance avoids future problems. Corrective maintenance Diagnose and fix logic errors. Replace defective network cabling. Restore proper configuration settings. Debug program code. Update drivers. Utilize remote control software for problem diagnosis and resolution. Adaptive maintenance. Add online capability. Add support for mobile devices. Add new data entry field to input screen. Install links to website. Create employee portal. Perfective maintenance. Upgrade or replace outdated hardware. Write macros to handle repetitive tasks. Compress system files. Optimize user desktop settings. Upgrade wireless network capability. Install more powerful network server. Preventive maintenance. Install new antivirus software. Develop standard backup schedule, including off-site and cloud-based strategies. Implement regular defragmentation process. Analyze problem report for patterns. Tighten all cable connections. Develop user guide covering confidentiality rules and unauthorized <coughs> use of company IT resources. Maintenance expenses usually are high when a system is implemented because problems must be detected, investigated, and resolved by corrective maintenance. Once the system becomes stable, costs usually remain low and involve minor adaptive maintenance. Eventually, both adaptive and perfective maintenance activities increase in a dynamic business environment. Near the end of a system's useful life, adaptive and corrective maintenance expenses increase rapidly, but perfective maintenance typically decreases when it becomes clear that the company plans to replace the system. Figure 12-4 shows the typical patterns for each of the four classifications of maintenance activities over a system's lifespan. 
Corrective maintenance. Corrective maintenance diagnoses and corrects errors in an operational system. To avoid introducing new problems, all maintenance work requires careful analysis before making changes. The best maintenance approach is a scaled-down version of the SDLC itself, where investigation, analysis, design, and testing are performed before implementing any solution. Recall from Chapter 11 the differences between a test environment and an operational environment. Any maintenance work that could affect the system must be performed first in the test environment and then migrated to the operational system. IT support staff respond to errors in various ways, depending on the nature and severity of the problem. Most organizations have standard procedures for minor errors, such as an incorrect report title or an improper format for a data element. In a typical procedure, a user submits a system request that is evaluated, prioritized, and scheduled by the system administrator or the system's review committee. If the request is approved, the maintenance team designs, tests, documents, and implements a solution. As stated in Chapter 2, many organizations use a standard online form for systems requests. In smaller firms, the process might be an informal email message. For more serious situations, such as incorrect report totals or inconsistent data, a user submits a system request with supporting evidence. Those requests receive a high priority and a maintenance team begins work on the problem immediately. The worst case situation is a system failure. If an emergency occurs, the maintenance team bypasses the initial steps and tries to correct the problem immediately. This often requires a patch which is a specially written software module that provides temporary repairs so operations can resume. Meanwhile, a written systems request is prepared by a user or a member of the IT department and added to the maintenance log. When the system is operational again, the maintenance team determines the cause, analyzes the problem, and designs a permanent solution. The IT response team updates the test data files, thoroughly tests the system, and prepares full documentation. Regardless of how the priorities are set, a standard ranking method can be helpful. For example, Figure 12-5 shows a three-level framework for IT support potential impact. Figure 12-5 This three-level ranking framework for IT support considers potential impact and response urgency. The process of managing system support is described in more detail in Section 12.3 including an overview of maintenance tasks and a procedural flowchart. Adaptive Maintenance Adaptive maintenance adds enhancements to an operational system and makes the system easier to use. An enhancement is a new feature or capability. The need for adaptive maintenance usually arises from business environment changes such as new products or services, new manufacturing technology, or support for a new web-based operation. The procedure for minor adaptive maintenance is similar to routine corrective maintenance. A user submits a system request that is evaluated and prioritized by the system's review committee. A maintenance team then analyzes, designs, tests, and implements the enhancement. Although the procedures for the two types of maintenance are alike, adaptive maintenance requires more IT department resources than minor corrective maintenance. A major adaptive maintenance project is like a small-scale SDLC project because the development procedure is similar. Adaptive maintenance can be more difficult than new systems development because the enhancements must work within the constraints of an existing system. Perfective maintenance. Perfective maintenance involves changing an operational system to make it more efficient, reliable, or maintainable. Requests for corrective and adaptive maintenance normally come from users, while the IT department usually initiates perfective maintenance. During system operation, changes in user activity or data patterns can cause a decline in efficiency, and perfective maintenance might be needed to restore performance. When users are concerned about performance, it should be determined if a perfective maintenance project could improve response time and system efficiency. Perfective maintenance also can improve system reliability. For example, input problems might cause a program to terminate abnormally. 
by modifying the data entry process, errors can be highlighted and users notified that they must enter proper data. When a system is easier to maintain, support is less costly and less risky. In many cases, a complex program can be simplified to improve maintainability. In many organizations, perfective maintenance is not performed frequently enough. Companies with limited resources often consider new systems development, adaptive maintenance, and corrective maintenance more important than perfective maintenance. Managers and users constantly request new projects, so few resources are available for perfective maintenance work. As a practical matter, perfective maintenance can be performed as part of another project. For example, if a new function must be added to a program, perfective maintenance can be included in the adaptive maintenance project. Perfective maintenance usually is cost-effective during the middle of the system's operational life. Early in systems operation, perfective maintenance usually is not needed. Later, perfective maintenance might be necessary but have a high cost. Perfective maintenance is less important if the company plans to discontinue the system. When performing perfective maintenance, analysts often use a technique called software reengineering. Software reengineering uses analytical techniques to identify potential quality and performance improvements in an information system. In that sense, software reengineering is similar to business process reengineering, which seeks to simplify operations, reduce costs, and improve quality. Programs that need a large number of maintenance changes usually are good candidates for reengineering. The more a program changes, the more likely it is to become inefficient and difficult to maintain. Detailed records of maintenance work can identify systems with a history of frequent corrective, adaptive, or perfective maintenance. Preventive maintenance. To avoid problems, preventive maintenance requires analysis of areas where trouble is likely to occur. Like perfective maintenance, the IT department normally initiates preventive maintenance. Preventive maintenance often results in increased user satisfaction, decreased downtime, and reduced TCO. Preventive maintenance competes for IT resources along with other projects and sometimes does not receive the high priority that it deserves. Regardless of the type of maintenance, trained professionals must support computer systems, just as skilled technicians must service the particle detector at CERN shown in Figure 12-6. In both cases, the quality of the maintenance will directly affect the organization's success. Maintenance Management System maintenance requires effective management, quality assurance, and cost control. To achieve these goals, companies use various strategies, such as a maintenance team, a maintenance management program, a configuration management process, and a maintenance release procedure. In addition, firms use version control and baselines to track system releases and analyze the system's life cycle. These concepts are described in the following sections. The maintenance team. A maintenance team includes a system administrator and one or more systems analysts and programmers. The system administrator should have solid technical expertise and experience in troubleshooting and configuring operating systems and hardware. Successful analysts need a strong IT background, solid analytical abilities, good communication skills, and an overall understanding of business operations. System administrator a system administrator manages computer and network systems. A system administrator must work well under pressure, have good organizational and communication skills, and be able to understand and resolve complex issues in a limited time frame. In most organizations, a system administrator has primary responsibility for the operation, configuration, and security of one or more systems. The system administrator is responsible for routine maintenance and usually is authorized to take preventive action to avoid an immediate emergency, such as a server crash, network outage, security incident, or hardware failure. Systems Analysts Systems analysts assigned to a maintenance team are like skilled detectives who investigate and rapidly locate the source of a problem by using analysis and synthesis skills. 
Analysis means examining the whole in order to learn about the individual elements, while synthesis involves studying the parts to understand the overall system. In addition to strong technical skills, an analyst must have a solid grasp of business operations and functions. Analysts also need effective interpersonal and communication skills, and they must be creative, energetic, and eager for new knowledge. Programmers In a small organization, a programmer might be expected to handle a wide variety of tasks, but in larger firms, programming work tends to be more specialized. For example, Typical job titles include an applications programmer, who works on new systems development and maintenance. A systems programmer, who concentrates on operating system software and utilities. And a database programmer, who focuses on creating and supporting large-scale database systems. Many IT departments also use a job title of programmer analyst to designate positions that require a combination of systems analysis and programming skills organizational issues. IT managers often divide systems analysts and programmers into two groups. One group performs new system development, and the other group handles maintenance. Some organizations use a more flexible approach and assign IT staff members to various projects as they occur. By integrating development and support work, the people developing the system assume responsibility for maintaining it. Because the team is familiar with the project, Additional training or expense is unnecessary, and members are likely to have a sense of ownership from the onset. Unfortunately, many analysts feel that maintenance is less interesting and less creative than developing new systems. In addition, an analyst might find it challenging to troubleshoot and support someone else's work that might have been poorly documented and organized. Some organizations that have separate maintenance and new systems groups rotate people from one assignment to the other. When analysts learn different skills, the organization is more versatile, and people can shift to meet changing business needs. For instance, systems analysts working on maintenance projects learn why it is important to design easily maintainable systems. Similarly, analysts working on new systems get a better appreciation of the development process and the design compromises necessary to meet business objectives. One disadvantage of rotation is that it increases overhead because time is lost when people move from one job to another. When systems analysts constantly shift between maintenance and new development, they have less opportunity to become highly skilled at any one job. Newly hired and recently promoted IT staff members often are assigned to maintenance projects because their managers believe that the opportunity to study existing systems and documentation is a valuable experience. In addition, the mini SDLC used in many adaptive maintenance projects is good training for the full-scale systems development life cycle. For a new systems analyst, however, maintenance work might be more difficult than systems development, and it might make sense to assign a new person to a development team where experienced analysts are available to provide training and guidance. Maintenance Requests Typically, maintenance requests involve a series of steps, as shown in Figure 12-7. After a user submits a request, a system administrator determines whether immediate action is needed and whether the request is under a prescribed cost limit. In non-emergency requests that exceed the cost limit, a system review committee assesses the request and either approves it, with a priority, or rejects it. The system administrator notifies affected users of the outcome. Users submit most requests for corrective and adaptive maintenance when the system is not performing properly or if they want new features. IT staff members usually initiate requests for perfective and preventive maintenance. To keep a complete maintenance log, all work must be covered by a specific request that users submit in writing or by email. Initial Determination when a user submits a maintenance request, the system administrator makes an initial determination. If the request is justifiable and involves a severe problem that requires immediate attention, the system administrator takes action at once. In justifiable, but non-critical, situations, the administrator determines whether the request can be performed within a pre-authorized cost level. If so, he or she assigns the maintenance tasks and monitors the work. 
The System Review Committee When a request exceeds a predetermined cost level or involves a major configuration change, the System Review Committee either approves it and assigns a priority or rejects it. Task Completion The system administrator usually is responsible for assigning maintenance tasks to individuals or to a maintenance team. Depending on the situation and the company's policy, the system administrator might consider rotating assignments among the IT staff or limiting maintenance tasks to certain individuals or teams, as explained in the previous section. User Notification Users who initiate maintenance requests expect a prompt response, especially if the situation directly affects their work. Even when corrective action cannot occur immediately, users appreciate feedback from the system administrator and should be kept informed of any decisions or actions that could affect them. Establishing Priorities In many companies, the System Review Committee separates maintenance and new development requests when setting priorities. In other organizations, all requests are considered together and the most important project gets top priority, whether it is maintenance or new development. Some IT managers believe that evaluating all projects together leads to the best possible decisions because maintenance and new development require similar IT department resources. In IT departments where maintenance and new development are not integrated, it might be better to evaluate requests separately. Another advantage of a separate approach is that maintenance is more likely to receive a proportional share of IT department resources. The most important objective is to have a procedure that balances new development and necessary maintenance work to provide the best support for business requirements and priorities. Configuration Management Configuration Management parenthesis, CM, in parenthesis, sometimes referred to as change control, parenthesis, CC, in parenthesis, is a process for controlling changes in system requirements during software development. CM also is an important tool for managing system changes and costs after a system becomes operational. Most companies establish a specific process that describes how system changes must be requested and documented. As enterprise-wide information systems grow more complex, CM becomes critical. Industry standards have emerged, such as the IEEE Standard 828-2012 for CM in systems and software, as shown in Figure 12-8. CM is especially important if a system has multiple versions that run in different hardware and software environments. CM also helps to organize and handle documentation. An operational system has extensive documentation that covers development, modification, and maintenance for all versions of the installed system. Most documentation material, including the initial system's request, project management data, end-of-phase reports, data dictionary, and the IT operations and user manuals, is stored in the IT department. Keeping track of all documentation and ensuring that updates are distributed properly are important aspects of CM. Maintenance releases Keeping track of maintenance changes and updates can be difficult, especially for a complex system. When a maintenance release methodology is used, all non-critical changes are held until they can be implemented at the same time. Each change is documented and installed as a new version of the system called a maintenance release. For an in-house developed system, the time between releases usually depends on the level of maintenance activity. A new release to correct a critical error, however, might be implemented immediately rather than saved for the next scheduled release. When a release method is used, a numbering pattern distinguishes the different releases. In a typical system, the initial version of the system is 1.0, and the release that includes the first set of maintenance changes is version 1.1. A change, for example, from version 1.4 to 1.5 indicates relatively minor enhancements, while whole number changes, such as from version 1.0 to 2.0 or from version 3.4 to 4.0, indicate a significant upgrade. The release methodology offers several advantages, especially if two teams perform maintenance work on the same system. When a release methodology is used, 
All changes are tested together before a new system version is released. This approach results in fewer versions, less expense, and less interruption for users. Using a release methodology also reduces the documentation burden because all changes are coordinated and become effective simultaneously. A release methodology also has some potential disadvantages. Users expect a rapid response to their problems and requests, but with a release methodology, new features or upgrades are available less often. Even when changes would improve system efficiency or user productivity, the potential savings must wait until the next release, which might increase operational costs. Commercial software suppliers also provide maintenance releases, often called service packs, as shown in Figure 12-9. As Microsoft explains, a service pack contains all the fixes and enhancements that have been made available since the last program version or service pack. Version Control Version control is the process of tracking system releases, or versions. When a new version of a system is installed, the prior release is archived or stored. If a new version causes a system to fail, a company can reinstall the prior version to restore operations. In addition to tracking system versions, the IT staff is responsible for configuring systems that have several modules at various release stages. For example, an accounting system might have a one-year-old accounts receivable module that must interface with a brand new payroll module. Many firms use commercial applications to handle version control for complex systems. There are also numerous free and open source alternatives. For example, one of the most popular version control systems is Git, which is shown in Figure 12-10. Git is a free and open source program designed for distributed systems. It is relatively easy to use, is available across most major platforms, and is supported by the developer community. Baselines A baseline is a formal reference point that measures system characteristics at a specific time. Systems analysts use baselines as yardsticks to document features and performance during the system's development process. The three types of baselines are functional, allocated, and product. The functional baseline is the configuration of the system documented at the beginning of the project. It consists of all the necessary system requirements and design constraints. The allocated baseline documents the system at the end of the design phase and identifies any changes since the functional baseline. The allocated baseline includes testing and verification of all system requirements and features. The product baseline describes the system at the beginning of system operation. The product baseline incorporates any changes made since the allocated baseline and includes the results of performance and acceptance tests for the operational system. System Performance Management Years ago, when most firms used a central computer for processing data, it was relatively simple to manage a system and measure its efficiency. Today, companies use complex networks, client-server systems, and cloud computing environments to support business needs. A user at a client workstation often interacts with an information system that depends on other clients, servers, networks, and data located throughout the company. Rather than a single computer, it is the integration of all those components that determines the system's capability and performance. To ensure satisfactory support for business operations, the IT department must manage system faults and interruptions, measure system performance and workload, and anticipate future needs. In many situations, IT managers use automated software and case tools to help with these tasks. Automated tools can provide valuable assistance during the operation and support phases. Many case tools include system evaluation and maintenance features, such as the following. Performance monitors that provide data on program execution times. Program analyzers that scan source code, provide data element cross-reference information, and help evaluate the impact of a program change. Interactive debugging analyzers that locate the source of a programming error. Re-engineering tools. Automated documentation capabilities. Network activity monitors. 
workload forecasting tools. In addition to case tools, spreadsheet and presentation software can be used to calculate trends, perform what-if analyses, and create attractive charts and graphs to display the results. Information technology planning is an essential part of the business planning process and often part of the presentations made to management. Fault management. No matter how well it is designed, every system will experience some problems, such as hardware failures, software errors, user mistakes, and power outages. A system administrator must detect and resolve operational problems as quickly as possible. That task, often called fault management, includes monitoring the system for signs of trouble, logging all system failures, diagnosing the problem, and applying corrective action. The more complex the system, the more difficult it can be to analyze symptoms and isolate a cause. In addition to addressing the immediate problem, it is important to evaluate performance patterns and trends. For example, the Activity Monitor application shown in Figure 12-11 runs on Apple's Mac OS X to display CPU, memory, energy, disk, and network activity of all running applications in real time. Similar programs, such as the Resource Monitor, are available on Windows. Fault management software can help identify underlying causes, speed up response time, and reduce service outages. Although system administrators must deal with system faults and interruptions as they arise, the best strategy is to prevent problems by monitoring system performance and workload. Performance and Workload Measurement In e-business, slow performance can be as devastating as no performance at all. Network delays and application bottlenecks affect customer satisfaction, user productivity, and business results. In fact, many IT managers believe that network delays do more damage than actual stoppages because they occur more frequently and are difficult to predict, detect, and prevent. Customers expect reliable, fast response 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. To support that level of service, companies use performance management software. To measure system performance, many firms use benchmark testing which uses a set of standard tests to evaluate system performance and capacity. In addition to benchmark testing, performance measurements, called metrics, can monitor the number of transactions processed in a given time period, the number of records accessed, and the volume of online data. Network performance metrics include response time, bandwidth, throughput, and turnaround time, among others. Response time. Response time is the overall time between a request for system activity and the delivery of the response. In the typical online environment, response time is measured from the instant the user presses the enter key or clicks a mouse button until the requested screen display appears or printed output is ready. Response time is affected by the system design, capabilities, and processing methods. If the request involves network or internet access, Response time is affected by data communication factors. Online users expect an immediate response, and they are frustrated by any apparent lag or delay. Of all performance measurements, response time is the one that users notice and complain about most. Bandwidth and throughput Bandwidth and throughput are closely related terms, and many analysts use them interchangeably. Bandwidth describes the amount of data that the system can transfer in a fixed time period. Bandwidth requirements are expressed in bits per second. Depending on the system, bandwidth can be measured in kilobits per second, kbps, megabits per second, mbps, or gigabits per second, gbps. Analyzing bandwidth is similar to forecasting the hourly number of vehicles that will use a highway in order to determine the number of lanes required. Throughput measures actual system performance under specific circumstances and is affected by network loads and hardware efficiency. Like bandwidth, throughput is expressed as a data transfer rates, such as kbps, mbps, or gbps. Just as traffic jams delay highway traffic, throughput limitations can slow system performance and response time. That is especially true with graphics-intensive systems and web-based systems that are subject to Internet-related conditions. 
In addition to the performance metrics explained in the previous section, system administrators measure many other performance characteristics. Although no standard set of metrics exist, several typical examples are as follows. Arrivals, the number of items that appear on a device during a given observation time. Busy, the time that a given resource is unavailable. Completions, the number of arrivals that are processed during a given observation period. Queue length, the number of requests pending for a service. Service time, the time it takes to process a given task once it reaches the front of the queue. Think time, the time it takes an application user to issue another request. Utilization, how much of a given resource was required to complete a task. Wait time, the time that requests must wait for a resource to become available. Turnaround time. Turnaround time applies to centralized batch processing operations, such as customer billing or credit card statement processing. Turnaround time measures the time between submitting a request for information and the fulfillment of the request. Turnaround time also can be used to measure the quality of IT support or services by measuring the time from a user request for help to the resolution of the problem. The IT department often measures response time, bandwidth, throughput, and turnaround time to evaluate system performance both before and after changes to the system or business information requirements. Performance data also is used for cost-benefit analyses of proposed maintenance and to evaluate systems that are nearing the end of their economically useful lives. Finally, management uses current performance and workload data as input for the capacity planning process. Capacity Planning Capacity planning is a process that monitors current activity and performance levels anticipates future activity, and forecasts the resources needed to provide desired levels of service. The first step in capacity planning is to develop a current model based on the system's present workload and performance specifications. Then future demand and user requirements are projected over a one to three year time period. The model is analyzed to see what is needed to maintain satisfactory performance and meet requirements. To assist in the process, a technique called what-if analysis can be used. What-if analysis varies one or more elements in a model in order to measure the effect on other elements. For example, what-if analysis might be used to answer questions such as the following, how will response time be affected if more client workstations were added to the network? Will the client server system be able to handle the growth in sales from the new website? What will be the effect on server throughput if more memory is added? Powerful spreadsheet tools also can assist in performing what-if analysis. For example, Microsoft Excel contains a feature called Goal Seek that determines what changes are necessary in one value to produce a specific result for another value. In the example shown in Figure 12-12, a capacity planning worksheet indicates that the system can handle 3,840 web-based orders per day at 22.5 seconds each. Excel calculates this automatically using the simple formula, equals, 86,400 divided by B4 for cell B5. There are 86,400 seconds in a 24-hour day in parenthesis, the user wants to know the effect on processing time if the number of transactions increases to 9,000. As the goal seek solution in the bottom figure shows, order processing will have to be performed in 9.6 seconds to achieve that goal. During planned capacity, detailed information is needed about the number of transactions, the daily, weekly, or monthly transaction patterns, the number of queries, and the number, type, and size of all generated reports. If the system involves a LAN, network traffic levels must be estimated to determine whether or not the existing hardware and software can handle the load. If the system uses a client-server design, Performance and connectivity specifications must be examined for each platform. Most important, an accurate forecast of future business activities is needed. If new business functions or requirements are predicted, contingency plans should be developed based on input from users and management. The main objective is to ensure that the system meets all future demands and provides effective support for business operations.
Some firms handle their own capacity planning, while others purchase software such as Adara's Uptime Infrastructure Monitor, shown in Figure 12-13. System Security Security is a vital part of every information system. Security protects the system and keeps it safe, free from danger, and reliable. In a global environment that includes many types of threats and attacks, security is more important than ever. This section includes a discussion of system security concepts, risk management, and common attacks against the system. System Security Concepts The CIA triangle in Figure 12-14 shows the three main elements of system security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality protects information from unauthorized disclosure and safeguards privacy. Integrity prevents unauthorized users from creating, modifying, or deleting information. Availability ensures that authorized users have timely and reliable access to necessary information. The first step in managing IT security is to develop a security policy based on these three elements. Risk Management In the real world, absolute security is not a realistic goal. Instead, managers must balance the value of the assets being protected potential risks to the organization, and security costs. For example, it might not be worth installing an expensive video camera monitoring system to protect an empty warehouse. To achieve the best results, most firms use a risk management approach that involves constant attention to three interactive tasks, risk identification, risk assessment, and risk control, as shown in Figure 12-15. Risk identification analyzes the organization's assets, threats, and vulnerabilities. Risk assessment measures risk likelihood and impact. Risk control develops safeguards that reduce risks and their impact. Risk identification. The first step in risk identification is to list and classify business assets. An asset might include company hardware, software, data, networks, people, or procedures. For each asset, a risk manager rates the impact of an attack and analyzes possible threats. A threat is an internal or external entity that could endanger an asset. For example, threat categories might include natural disasters, software attacks, or theft, as shown in Figure 12-16. Figure 12-16 System threats can be grouped into several broad categories. Next. The risk manager identifies vulnerabilities and how they might be exploited. A vulnerability is a security weakness or soft spot, and an exploit is an attack that takes advantage of a vulnerability. To identify vulnerabilities, a risk manager might ask questions like these, could hackers break through the proxy server? Could employees retrieve sensitive files without proper authorization? Could people enter the computer room and sabotage our servers? Each vulnerability is rated and assigned a value. The output of risk identification is a list of assets, vulnerabilities, and ratings. Risk Assessment In IT security terms, a risk is the impact of an attack multiplied by the likelihood of a vulnerability being exploited. For example, an impact value of 2 and a vulnerability rating of 10 would produce a risk of 20. On the other hand, an impact value of 5 and a vulnerability rating of 5 would produce a risk of 25. When risks are calculated and prioritized, critical risks will head the list. Although ratings can be subjective, the overall process provides a consistent approach and framework. Risk Control After risks are identified and assessed, they must be controlled. Control measures might include the following examples. We could place a firewall on the proxy server. We could assign permissions to sensitive files. We could install biometric devices to guard the computer room. Typically, management chooses one of four risk control strategies, avoidance, mitigation, transference, or acceptance. Avoidance eliminates the risk by adding protective safeguards. For example, to prevent unauthorized access to LAN computers, a secure firewall might be installed. 
mitigation reduces the impact of a risk by careful planning and preparation. For example, a company can prepare a disaster recovery plan in case a natural disaster occurs. Transference shifts the risk to another asset or party, such as an insurance company. Acceptance means that nothing is done. Companies usually accept a risk only when the protection clearly is not worth the expense. The risk management process is iterative. Risks are constantly identified, assessed, and controlled. To be effective, risk managers need a combination of business knowledge, IT skills, and experience with security tools and techniques. Attacker Profiles and Attacks An attack is a hostile act that targets the system or the company itself. Thus, a disgruntled employee or a hacker who is 6,000 miles away might launch an attack. Attackers break into a system to cause damage, steal information, or gain recognition, among other reasons. Attackers can be grouped into categories, as shown in Figure 12-17, while Figure 12-18 describes some common types of attacks. Companies combat security threats and challenges by using a multi-level strategy. Figure 12-17 IT security professionals have names for various types of attackers. Figure 12-18 Attacks can take many forms, as this table shows. IT security managers must be able to detect these attacks and respond with suitable countermeasures. Security Levels To provide system security, six separate but interrelated levels must be considered, physical security, network security, application security, file security, user security, and procedural security. Like the chain shown in Figure 12-19, system security is only as strong as the weakest link. The following sections describe these security levels and the issues that must be addressed. Top management often makes the final strategic and budget decisions regarding security, but systems analysts should understand the overall picture in order to make informed recommendations. Physical Security The first level of system security concerns the physical environment, including IT resources and people throughout the company. Special attention must be paid to critical equipment located in operations centers, where servers, network hardware, and related equipment operate. Large companies usually have a dedicated room built specifically for IT operations. Smaller firms might use an office or storage area, Regardless of its size and shape, an operations center requires special protection from unwanted intrusion. In addition to centrally located equipment, all computers on the network must be secure because each server or workstation can be a potential access point. Physical access to a computer represents an entry point into the system and must be controlled and protected. Operations Center Security Perimeter security is essential in any room or area where computer equipment is operated or maintained. Physical access must be controlled tightly, and each entrance must be equipped with a suitable security device. All access doors should have internal hinges and electromagnetic locks that are equipped with a battery backup system to provide standby power in the event of a power outage. When the battery power is exhausted, the doors should fail in a closed position, but it should be possible for someone locked inside the room to open the door with an emergency release. To enhance security, many companies are installing biometric scanning systems, which map an individual's facial features, fingerprints, handprint, or eye characteristics, as shown in Figure 12-20. These high-tech authentication systems replaced magnetic identification badges, which can be lost, stolen, or altered. Apple's Face ID system, described in Chapter 2, is an example of a biometric security system for smartphones and mobile devices, as discussed in the section on portable computers that follows. Video cameras and motion sensors can be used to monitor computer room security and provide documentation of all physical activity in the area. A motion sensor uses infrared technology to detect movement and can be configured to provide audible or silent alarms, and to send email messages when one is triggered. 
Other types of sensors can monitor temperature and humidity in the computer room. Motion sensor alarms can be activated at times when there is no expected activity in the computer room, and authorized technicians should have codes to enable or disable the alarms. Servers and Desktop Computers If possible, server and desktop computer cases should be equipped with locks. This simple, but important, precaution might prevent an intruder from modifying the hardware configuration of a server, damaging the equipment, or removing a disk drive. Server racks should be locked to avoid the unauthorized placement and retrieval of keystroke loggers. A keystroke logger is a device that can be inserted between a keyboard and a computer. Typically, the device resembles an ordinary cable plug, so it does not call attention to itself. The device can record everything that is typed into the keyboard, including passwords, while the system continues to function normally. Keystroke loggers can be used legitimately to monitor, back up, and restore a system, but if placed by an intruder, a keystroke logger represents a serious security threat. In addition to hardware devices, keystroke logging software also exists. A keystroke logging program can be disguised as legitimate software and downloaded from the Internet or a company network. The program remains invisible to the user as it records keystrokes and uploads the information to whoever installed the program. Such malicious software can be removed by antivirus and anti-spyware software, discussed later in the application security section. Tamper-evident cases should be used where possible. A tamper-evident case is designed to show any attempt to open or unlock the case. In the event that a computer case has been opened, an indicator LED remains lit until it is cleared with a password. Tamper-evident cases do not prevent intrusion, but a security breach is more likely to be noticed. Many servers now are offered with tamper-evident cases as part of their standard configuration. Monitor screen savers that hide the screen and require special passwords to clear should be used on any server or workstation that is left unattended. Locking the screen after a period of inactivity is another safeguard. A BIOS-level password, also called a boot-level password or a power-on password, can also be used. This password must be entered before the computer can be started. A boot-level password can prevent an unauthorized person from booting a computer by using a secondary device. Finally, companies must consider electric power issues. In mission-critical systems, large-scale backup power sources are essential to continue business operations. In other cases, computer systems and network devices should be plugged into an uninterruptible power supply, UPS, that includes battery backup with suitable capacity. The UPS should be able to handle short-term operations in order to permit an orderly backup and system shutdown. Portable Computers When assessing physical security issues, be sure to consider additional security provisions for notebook, laptop, and tablet computers. Because of their small size and high value, these computers are tempting targets for thieves and industrial spies. Although the following suggestions are intended as a checklist for notebook computer security, many of them also apply to desktop workstations. Select an operating system that allows secure logons, BIOS-level passwords, and strong firewall protection. Log on and work with a user account that has limited privileges rather than an administrator account and mask the administrator account by giving it a different name that would be hard for a casual intruder to guess. Mark or engrave the computer's case with the company name and address, or attach a tamper-proof asset ID tag. Many hardware vendors allow corporate customers to add an asset ID tag in the BIOS. For example, after powering up, the following message may appear. Property of SCR Associates. Company use only. These measures might not discourage a professional thief, but might deter a casual thief, or at least make the computer relatively less desirable because it would be more difficult to use or resell. Security experts also recommend using a generic carrying case, such as an attaché case, rather than a custom carrying case that calls attention to itself and its contents. Consider devices that have a built-in fingerprint reader or facial recognition system. Many notebook computers have a universal security slot, USS, that can be fastened to a cable lock or laptop alarm. 
Again, while these precautions might not deter professional thieves, they might discourage and deter casual thieves. Back up all vital data before using the notebook computer outside the office. Save and transport highly sensitive data on removable media, such as a flash memory device, instead of the computer's hard drive. Use tracking software that directs the laptop to periodically contact a security tracking center. If the notebook is stolen, the call-in identifies the computer and its physical location. Armed with this information, the security tracking center can alert law enforcement agencies and communications providers. Apple, Google, and Microsoft offer services to locate lost customer smartphones. The services also permit remote data wipe and factory reset of the devices. For example, Apple's Find My iPhone app is shown in Figure 12-21. Apple also provides a similar cloud-based service. While traveling, try to be alert to potential high-risk situations where a thief or thieves might create a distraction and attempt to snatch the computer. These situations often occur in crowded, noisy places like airport baggage claim areas, rental car counters, and security checkpoints. Also, when traveling by car, store the computer in a trunk or lockable compartment where it will not be visible. Establish stringent password protection policies that require minimum length and complexity and set a limit on how many times an envelope password can be entered before the system locks itself down. In some situations, consider establishing file encryption policies to protect extremely sensitive files. Network Security a network is defined as two or more devices that are connected for the purpose of sending, receiving, and sharing data, which is called network traffic. In order to connect to a network, a computer must have a network interface, which is a combination of hardware and software that allows the computer to interact with the network. To provide security for network traffic, data can be encrypted, which refers to a process of encoding the data so it cannot be accessed without authorization. Encrypting network traffic. Network traffic can be intercepted and possibly altered, redirected, or recorded. For example, if an unencrypted, or plain text, password or credit card number is transmitted over a network connection, it can be stolen. When the traffic is encrypted, it still is visible, but its content and purpose are masked. Two commonly used encryption techniques are private key encryption and public key encryption. Private key encryption is symmetric because a single key is used to encrypt and decrypt information. While this method is simple and fast, it poses a fundamental problem. To use symmetric encryption, both the sender and receiver must possess the same key beforehand, or it must be sent along with the message, which increases the risk of interception and disclosure. In contrast, public key encryption, PKE, is asymmetric because each user has a pair of keys a public key and a private key. Public keys are used to encrypt messages. Users can share their public keys freely, while keeping their private keys tightly guarded. Any message encrypted with a user's public key can only be decrypted with that user's private key. This method is commonly used in secure online e-commerce systems. Wireless Networks as discussed in Chapter 10, wireless network security is a vital concern because wireless transmission is much more vulnerable than traffic on a wired network. However, if wireless traffic is encrypted, any data that is intercepted by an unintended recipient will be useless to the intruder. The earliest form of wireless security, called Wired Equivalent Privacy, WEP, required each wireless client to use a special, pre-shared key. Although many home and small office networks use this method, it provided relatively weak protection. WEP was replaced by Wi-Fi Protected Access, WPA, which offered major security improvements based on protocols created by the Wi-Fi Alliance. The most recent wireless security enhancement, called WPA2, further strengthens the level of wireless protection. WPA2 is an extension of WPA based on a full implementation of the IEEE 802.11i standard. According to the Wi-Fi Alliance, the WPA2 standard became mandatory for all new devices seeking Wi-Fi certification after 2006. 
WPA2 is compatible with WPA, so companies easily can migrate to the new security standard. Private networks. It is not always practical to secure all network traffic. Unfortunately, encrypting traffic increases the burden on a network and can decrease network performance significantly. In situations where network speed is essential, such as a web server linked to a database server, many firms use a private network to connect the computers. A private network is a dedicated connection, similar to a leased telephone line. Each computer on the private network must have a dedicated interface to the network, and no interface on the network should connect to any point outside the network. In this configuration, unencrypted traffic safely can be transmitted because it is not visible and cannot be intercepted from outside the network. Virtual Private Networks Private networks work well with a limited number of computers, but if a company wants to establish secure connections for a larger group, it can create a virtual private network. A virtual private network, VPN, uses a public network, such as the Internet or a company intranet, to connect remote users securely. Instead of using a dedicated connection, a VPN allows remote clients to use a special key exchange that must be authenticated by the VPN. Once authentication is complete, a secure network connection, called a tunnel, is established between the client and the access point of the local intranet. All traffic is encrypted through the VPN tunnel, which provides an additional level of encryption and security. As more companies allow employees to work from home, a VPN can provide acceptable levels of security and reliability. Ports and Services A port, which is identified by a number, is used to route incoming traffic to the correct application on a computer. In TCP IP networks, such as the Internet, all traffic received by a computer contains a destination port. Because the destination port determines where the traffic will be routed, the computer sorts the traffic by port number, which is included in the transmitted data. An analogy might be a large apartment building with multiple mailboxes. Each mailbox has the same street address, but a different box number. Port security is critically important because an attacker could use an open port to gain access to the system. A service is an application that monitors, or listens on, a particular port. For example, a typical email application listens on port 25. Any traffic received by that port is routed to the email application. Services play an important role in computer security, and they can be affected by port scans and denial of service attacks. Port scans. Port scans attempt to detect the services running on a computer by trying to connect to various ports and recording the ports on which a connection was accepted. For example, the result of an open port 25 would indicate that a mail server is running. Port scans can be used to draw an accurate map of a network and pinpoint possible weaknesses. Denial of service. A denial of service, DOS, attack occurs when an attacking computer makes repeated requests to a service or services running on certain ports. Because the target computer has to respond to each request, it can become bogged down and fail to respond to legitimate requests. A much more devastating attack based on this method is called a distributed denial of service DDoS, attack. This attack involves multiple attacking computers that can synchronize DOS attacks and immobilize a server, as shown in Figure 12-22. A DDoS attack is an example of the type of serious cyber attacks that United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team parenthesis, US CERT, shown in Figure 12-23 was created to address firewalls. A firewall is the main line of defense between a local network, or intranet, and the internet. A firewall must have at least one network interface with the internet, and at least one network interface with a local network or intranet. Firewall software examines all network traffic sent to and from each network interface. Preset rules establish certain conditions that determine whether the firewall will allow the traffic to pass. When a matching rule is found, the firewall automatically accepts, rejects, or drops the traffic. When a firewall rejects traffic, it sends a reply indicating that the traffic is not permissible. When a firewall drops traffic, no reply is sent. 
firewalls can be configured to detect and respond to denial of service attacks, port scans, and other suspicious activity. Figure 12-24 shows a basic set of firewall rules for a company that is a web server and a mail server. In this example, the firewall would accept public web server traffic only on ports 80 and 443 and public mail server traffic only on port 25. The firewall would allow private LAN traffic to any destination and port. Figure 12-24 Examples of rules that determine whether the firewall will allow traffic to pass. Network intrusion detection. Suppose an intruder attempts to gain access to the system. Obviously, an intrusion alarm should be sounded when certain activity or known attack patterns are detected. A network intrusion detection system, NIDS, is like a burglar alarm that goes off when it detects a configuration violation. The NIDS also can alert the administrator when it detects suspicious network traffic patterns. And NIDS requires fine-tuning to detect the difference between legitimate network traffic and an attack. It is also important that a NIDS be placed on a switch or other network device that can monitor all network traffic. Although a NIDS requires some administrative overhead, it can be very helpful in documenting the efforts of attackers and analyzing network performance. Application Security In addition to securing the computer room and shielding network traffic, it is necessary to protect all server-based applications. To do so, the analyst must analyze the application's functions, identify possible security concerns, and carefully study all available documentation. Application security requires an understanding of services, hardening, application permissions, input validation techniques software patches and updates, and software logs. Services The network security section explained how a service is an application that monitors, or listens, on a particular port. Which services are running can be determined by using a port scan utility. If a particular application is not needed, it should be disabled. This will improve system security, performance, and reliability. An unnecessary or improperly configured service could create a vulnerability called a security hole. For example, if a loosely configured file transfer protocol, FTP, service is available to a hacker, he or she might be able to upload destructive code to the server. Hardening The hardening process makes a system more secure by removing unnecessary accounts, services, and features. Hardening is necessary because the default configuration of some software packages might create vulnerability. For example, initial software settings often include relatively weak account permissions or file sharing controls. Hardening can be done manually or by using a configuration template, which speeds up the process in a large organization. Hardening also includes additional protections such as antivirus and anti-spyware software. These programs can detect and remove malware, which is hostile software designed to infiltrate, damage, or deny service to a computer system. Malware includes worms, Trojan horses, keystroke loggers, and spyware, among others. Application permissions Typically, an application is configured to be run only by users who have specific rights. For example, an administrator account, or superuser account, allows essentially unrestricted access. Other users might be allowed to enter data, but not to modify or delete existing data. To prevent unauthorized or destructive changes, the application should be configured so that non-privileged users can access the program but cannot make changes to built-in functions or configurations. User rights, also called permissions, are discussed in more detail in the file security section. Input validation as discussed in Chapter 8, when designing the user interface, input validation can safeguard data integrity and security. For example, if an application requires a number from 1 to 10, what happens if an alphabetic character or the number 31 is entered? If the application File security. Computer configuration settings, 
users' personal information, and other sensitive data are stored in files. The safety and protection of these files is a vital element in any computer security program, and a systems analyst needs to consider the importance of encryption or encoding files to make them unreadable by unauthorized users, and permissions, which can be assigned to individual users or to user groups. Encryption As explained in the section on network security, encryption scrambles the contents of a file or document to protect it from unauthorized access. All corporate data must be protected, but encryption is especially important for sensitive materials such as personnel or financial records. User data can be encrypted using features built into most modern operating systems. Permissions File security is based on establishing a set of permissions, which describe the rights a user has to a particular file or directory on a server. The most common permissions are read, write, and execute. Typical examples of permissions include the following. Read a file, the user can read the contents of the file. Write a file, the user can change the contents of the file. Execute a file, the user can run the file, if it is a program. Read a directory, the user can list the contents of the directory. Write a directory, the user can add and remove files in the directory. When assigning file permissions, a system administrator should ensure that each user has only the minimum permissions necessary to perform his or her work. Not more. In some firms, the system administrator has broad discretion in assigning these levels. In other companies, an appropriate level of management approval is required for any permissions above a standard user level. In any case, a well-documented and enforced permissions policy is necessary to promote file security and reduce system vulnerability. User Groups Individual users who need to collaborate and share files often request a higher level of permissions that would enable any of them to change file content. A better approach, from a system administrator's viewpoint, might be to create a user group, add specific users, and assign file permissions to the group rather than to the individuals. Many firms use this approach because it allows a user's rights to be determined by his or her work responsibilities, rather than by job title or rank. If a person is transferred, he or she leaves certain groups and joins others that reflect current job duties. User Security User security involves the identification of system users and consideration of user-related security issues. Regardless of other security precautions and features, security ultimately depends on system users and their habits, practices, and willingness to support security goals. Unfortunately, many system break-ins begin with a user account that is compromised in some way. Typically, an intruder accesses the system using the compromised account and may attempt a privilege escalation attack, which is an unauthorized attempt to increase permission levels. User security requires identity management, comprehensive password protection, defenses against social engineering, an effective means of overcoming user resistance, and consideration of new technologies. These topics are discussed in the following sections. Identity management. Identity management refers to controls and procedures necessary to identify legitimate users and system components. An identity management strategy must balance technology, security, privacy, cost, and user productivity. Identity management is an evolving technology that is being pursued intensively by corporations, IT associations, and governments. Gartner has described identity management as a set of electronic records that represent people, machines, devices, applications, and services. This definition suggests that not just users, but also each component in a system, must have a verifiable identity that is based on unique characteristics. For example, user authentication might be based on a combination of a password, a social security number, an employee number, a job title, and a physical location. Because of the devastating consequences of intrusion, IT managers should give top priority to identity management strategies and solutions. Password Protection As the section on physical security points out, a secure system must have a password policy that requires minimum length, complexity, 
and a limit on invalid login attempts. Although passwords are a key element in any security program, users often choose passwords that are easy to recall, and they sometimes resent having to remember complex passwords. For example, for several years in a row, one of the most common computer passwords has been 123,456, an unfortunate choice that is trivially easy to crack. As long as passwords are used, IT managers should insist on passwords that have a minimum length, require a combination of case-sensitive letters and numbers, and must be changed periodically. Unfortunately, any password can be compromised if a user writes it down and stores it in an easily accessible location such as a desk, a bulletin board, or under the keyboard. Several years ago, a hacker made headlines by gaining access to the email account of a political candidate. The intruder signed on as the candidate, requested a new password, guessed the answers to the security questions, and was able to enter the account. These actions were totally illegal and constituted a serious felony under federal law. Social engineering Even if users are protecting and securing their passwords, an intruder might attempt to gain unauthorized access to a system using a tactic called social engineering. In a social engineering attack, an intruder uses social interaction to gain access to a computer system. For example, the intruder might pretend to be a new employee, an outside technician, or a journalist. Through a series of questions, the intruder tries to obtain the information that he or she needs to compromise the system. A common ploy is for the attacker to contact several people in the same organization and use some information from one source to gain credibility and entry to another source. An intruder also might contact the help desk and say, Hi. This is Anna Dressler from Accounting. I seem to have forgotten my password. Could you give me a new one? Although this request might be legitimate, it also might be an attacker trying to access the system. A password never should be given based solely on this telephone call. The user should be required to provide further information to validate his or her identity, such as a unique employee ID, a telephone extension, and a company email address. One highly publicized form of social engineering is called pretexting, which is a method of obtaining personal information under false pretenses. Pretexting is commonly used as part of identity theft, wherein personal information or online credentials are stolen and used for illegal purposes. The Federal Trade Commission's Division of Privacy, Identity and Online Security has a section dedicated to helping consumers battle identify theft. The best way to combat social engineering attacks is with employee education, more training, and a high level of awareness during day-to-day -day operations. User Resistance Many users, including some senior managers, dislike tight security measures because the measures can be inconvenient and time-consuming. Systems analysts should remind users that the company owes the best possible security to its customers, who have entrusted personal information to the firm to its employees, who also have personal information stored in company files, and to its shareholders, who expect the company to have a suitable, effective, and comprehensive security program that will safeguard company assets and resources. When users understand this overall commitment to security and feel that they are part of it, they are more likely to choose better passwords, be more alert to security issues, and contribute to the overall success of the company's security program. New Technologies In addition to traditional measures and biometric devices, new technologies can enhance security and prevent unauthorized access. For example, the security token shown in Figure 12-25 is a physical device that authenticates a legitimate user. Some firms provide employees with security tokens that generate a numeric validation code, which the employee enters in addition to his or her normal password. Unfortunately, new technology sometimes creates new risks. For example, a powerful search application can scan all of the files, documents, emails, chats, and stored web pages on a user's computer. Although this might provide a convenient way for users to locate and retrieve their data, it also can make it easier for an intruder to obtain private information, especially in a multi-user environment because the program can recall and display almost anything stored on the computer.
Also, if an intruder uses the term password in a search, the program might be able to find password reminders that are stored anywhere on the computer. To increase privacy for multi-user computers, each user should have a separate account with individual usernames and passwords. Business and personal users also should use caution when they consider cloud-based storage and services. In this environment, where the technology changes rapidly, the best bet may be to work with well-established vendors who can provide significant cloud security experience and safeguards. Procedural security Procedural security, also called operational security, is concerned with managerial policies and controls that ensure secure operations. In fact, many IT professionals believe that security depends more on managerial issues than technology. Management must work to establish a corporate culture that stresses the importance of security to the firm and its people. Procedural security defines how particular tasks are to be performed, from large-scale data backups to everyday tasks such as storing emails or forms. Other procedures might spell out how to update firewall software or how security personnel should treat suspected attackers. All employees should understand that they have a personal responsibility for security. For example, an employee handbook might require that users log out of their system accounts, clear their desks, and secure all documents before leaving for the day. These policies reduce the risk of dumpster diving attacks, in which an intruder raids desks or trash bins for valuable information. In addition, paper shredders should be used to destroy sensitive documents. Procedural security also includes safeguarding certain procedures that would be valuable to an attacker. The most common approach is a need-to-know concept, where access is limited to employees who need the information to perform security-related tasks. Many firms also apply a set of classification levels for access to company documents. For example, highly sensitive technical documents might be available only to the IT support team, while user-related materials would be available to most company employees. If classification levels are used, they should be identified clearly and enforced consistently. Procedural security must be supported by upper management and fully explained to all employees. The organization must provide training to explain the procedures and issue reminders from time to time that will make security issues a priority. Backup and recovery Every system must provide for data backup and recovery. Backup refers to copying data at prescribed intervals, or continuously. Recovery involves restoring the data and restarting the system after an interruption. An overall backup and recovery plan that prepares for a potential disaster is called a disaster recovery plan. Global Terrorism The tragic events of September 11, 2001, and increased concern about global terrorism, have led many companies to upgrade their backup and disaster recovery plans. Heightened focus on disaster recovery has spawned a whole new industry, which includes new tools and strategies. Many IT professionals feel that terrorism concerns have raised security awareness throughout the corporate world. Although they are separate topics, backup and disaster recovery issues usually are intertwined. Backup Policies the cornerstone of business data protection is a backup policy, which contains detailed instructions and procedures. An effective backup policy can help a firm continue business operations and survive a catastrophe. The backup policy should specify backup media, backup types, and retention periods. Backup media Backup media can include tape, hard drives, optical storage, and online storage. Physical backups must be carefully identified and stored in a secure location. Offsetting refers to the practice of storing backup media away from the main business location in order to mitigate the risk of a catastrophic disaster such as a flood, a fire, or an earthquake. Even if the operating system includes a backup utility, many system administrators prefer to use specialized third-party software that offers more options and better controls for large-scale operations. In addition to on-site data storage, 
cloud-based storage is growing rapidly. Many companies use online backup and retrieval services offered by leading vendors. For a small or medium-sized firm, this option can be cost-effective and reliable. Backup types Backups can be full, differential, incremental, or continuous. A full backup is a complete backup of every file on the system. Frequent full backups are time-consuming and redundant if most files are unchanged since the last full backup. Instead of performing a full backup, another option is to perform a differential backup, which is faster because it backs up only the files that are new or changed since the last full backup. To restore the data to its original state, the last full backup is restored first, and then the last differential backup is restored. Many IT managers believe that a combination of full and differential backups is the best option because it uses the least amount of storage space and is simple. The fastest method, called an incremental backup, only includes recent files that never have been backed up by any method. This approach, however, requires multiple steps to restore the data. One for each incremental backup. Most large systems use continuous backup, which is a real-time streaming method that records all system activity as it occurs. This method requires hardware, software, and substantial network capacity. However, system restoration is rapid and effective because data is being captured in real time, as it occurs. Continuous backup often uses a redundant array of independent disks, RAID, system that mirrors the data. RAID systems are called fault-tolerant because a failure of any one disk does not disable the system. Compared to one large drive, a RAID design offers better performance, greater capacity, and improved reliability when installed on a server. Business Continuity Issues Global concern about terrorism has raised awareness levels and increased top management support for a business continuity strategy in the event of an emergency. A disaster recovery plan describes actions to be taken, specifies key individuals and rescue authorities to be notified, and spells out the role of employees in evacuation, mitigation, and recovery efforts. The disaster recovery plan should be accompanied by a test plan, which can simulate various levels of emergencies and record the responses, which can be analyzed and improved as necessary. After personnel are safe, damage to company assets should be mitigated. The plan might require shutting down systems to prevent further data loss or moving physical assets to a secure location. Afterward, the plan should focus on resuming business operations, including the salvaging or replacement of equipment and a recovery of backup data. The main objective of a disaster recovery plan is to restore business operations to pre-disaster levels. Disaster recovery plans are often part of a larger business continuity plan. BCP, which goes beyond a recovery plan, and defines how critical business functions can continue in the event of a major disruption. Some BCPs specify the use of a hot site. A hot site is an alternate IT location, anywhere in the world, that can support critical systems in the event of a power outage, system crash, or physical catastrophe. A hot site requires data replication, which means that any transaction on the primary system must be mirrored on the hot site. If the primary system becomes unavailable, the hot site will have the latest data and can function seamlessly, with no downtime. Although hot sites are attractive backup solutions, they are very expensive. However, a hot site provides the best insurance against major business interruptions. In addition to hot sites, Business insurance can be important in a worst-case scenario. Although expensive, business insurance can offset the financial impact of system failure and business interruption. System Retirement At some point, every system becomes obsolete and is ripe for retirement. For example, in the 1960s, punched cards represented the cutting edge of data management. Data was stored by punching holes at various positions and was retrieved by machines that could sense the presence or absence of a punched hole. Most full-size cards stored only 80 characters, 
or bytes, so more than 12,000 cards would be needed to store a megabyte. Punched cards were even used as checks and utility bills. Today, this technology is obsolete. Constantly changing technology means that every system has a limited economic lifespan. Analysts and managers can anticipate system obsolescence in several ways and it never should come as a complete surprise. A system becomes obsolete when it no longer supports user needs, or when the platform becomes outmoded. The most common reason for discontinuing a system is that it has reached the end of its economically useful life, as indicated by the following signs. The system's maintenance history indicates that adaptive and corrective maintenance are increasing steadily. Operational costs or execution times are increasing rapidly, and routine perfective maintenance does not reverse or slow the trend. A software package is available that provides the same or additional services faster, better, and less expensively than the current system. New technology offers a way to perform the same or additional functions more efficiently. Maintenance changes or additions are difficult and expensive to perform. Users request significant new features to support business requirements. Systems operation and support continue until a replacement system is installed. Toward the end of a system's operational life, users are unlikely to submit new requests for adaptive maintenance because they are looking forward to the new release. Similarly, the IT staff usually does not perform much perfective or preventive maintenance because the system will not be around long enough to justify the cost. A system in its final stages requires corrective maintenance only to keep the system operational. User satisfaction typically determines the lifespan of a system. The critical success factor for any system is whether or not it helps users achieve their operational and business goals. All negative feedback should be investigated and documented, because it can be the first signal of system obsolescence. At some point in a system's operational life, maintenance costs start to increase, users begin to ask for more features and capability, new systems requests are submitted, and the SDLC begins again. Future Challenges and Opportunities there is an old saying that the only constant in life is change. The same is true for information technology. Except that the rate of change in IT seems to increase every year. Rapid change can present numerous challenges to organizations and individuals, but it can also offer exciting new opportunities. The secret to success is to be ready for the changes that are bound to occur and be proactive, not reactive. No prudent professional would start a complex journey without a map and a plan. To navigate the future of information technology, companies require strategic plans, which were discussed in Chapter 2. An individual also needs a plan to reach to a specific goal or destination. This section discusses trends and predictions that will affect all IT professionals. To prepare for the challenges ahead, individuals will need to plan and develop their knowledge, skills, and credentials. Trends and predictions. Navigating an IT career can be compared to sailing a small ship in difficult seas. Even a very good captain with a clear map for guidance will be subjected to forces and circumstances that are sometimes beyond their control. What can be done is to understand these forces and try to prepare for them. Figure 12 minus 27 describes the winds of change that may influence IT trends, including globalization, technology integration, service orientation, cloud computing, and the workplace of the future. Figure 12 minus 27. Major trends and their impact on IT in general and on future systems analysts. In addition to the trends described in Figure 12 minus 27, most firms will face economic, social, and political uncertainty. Many IT experts believe that in this environment, the top priorities will be the safety and security of corporate operations, agility and the ability to quickly respond to changing market forces, and bottom line TCO. Here are some examples of possible trends and developments over the next few years. Cybercrime will increase significantly, with negative financial, social, and national security implications. 
smartphones and tablets will become the dominant computing platform for most users, bypassing the traditional PC or laptop as the device of choice. Software as a Service SaaS, will become the norm, which will affect business models and consumer costs as the industry moves from a purchase to a leasing model for computer applications. Cloud computing will become the principal computing infrastructure for the enterprise which in turn will enable software as a service and lower TCO. In sourcing, the moving of jobs from offshore locations back home will increase due to economic factors such as higher wages in emerging markets, improved automation through the use of sophisticated manufacturing robots, security concerns from outsourced components, hardware and software developed overseas, and political pressure to preserve jobs. It is entirely possible that large enterprises would require suppliers to certify their security credentials and sourcing policies. Another issue might relate to the growth of cloud computing and large-scale data centers such as the one shown in Figure 12-28. Access controls and issues related to international law concerning ownership and surveillance of network activity between the data centers and customers around the world will become progressively more important as the digital life of companies and individuals are placed online. It's also possible that large enterprises will require suppliers to certify their green credentials and sourcing policies. One issue might relate to the explosion of data storage and server farms, such as the one shown in Figure 12-28. These server farms can use massive amounts of electricity for normal operation and for cooling, which affects the environment and the corporate bottom line. Strategic Planning for IT Professionals A systems analyst should think like a small business entrepreneur who has certain assets, potential liabilities, and the specific goals. Individuals, like companies, must have a strategic plan. The starting point is to formulate an answer to the following question, have career goals been set for the next year, the next three years, and the next five years? Working backward from these goals. Intermediate milestones can be developed. An analyst's career can be managed just as an IT project would be managed. The project management tools described in Chapter 3 can be used to construct a Gantt chart or a PERT CPM chart using months, parentheses, or years, as time units. Once the plan is developed, it should be monitored regularly to stay on track. As with an agile enterprise, Progress towards satisfying career goals should be corrected as needed. IT Credentials and Certification In recent years, technical credentials and certification have become extremely important to IT employers and employees. In a broad sense, credentials include formal degrees, diplomas, or certificates granted by learning institutions to show that a certain level of education has been achieved. The term certification also has a special meaning that relates to specific hardware and software skills that can be measured and verified by examination. For example, a person might have a two- or four-year degree in information systems and possess an ISTQB Foundation Level Certification shown in Figure 12-29 which attests to the person's software testing knowledge and skills. Rapid changes in the IT field require professionals adopt a lifelong learning approach to managing their career. Even advanced degrees from universities have a short half-life, which means continuing education credits are needed to maintain competency. Many professional organizations offer continuing education courses and credentialed certificates, such as the ACM and the IEEE as do IT industry leaders such as Microsoft, Cisco, and Oracle. Critical Thinking Skills In addition to technical skills, systems analysts must have soft skills, such as communications, interpersonal, and perceptive abilities. In fact, employers often lament the fact that their new hires are technically adept but lacking in these other areas. For a successful career, these areas must be mastered too, particularly for more senior leadership positions in the organization. IT professionals also need critical thinking skills to succeed in the workplace. Perhaps the most important skill taught to students in school is how to learn so that they can adapt to dynamic environments later in their career. 
For example, it's not so important for developers to know the latest programming languages as it is for them to be able to learn a new programming language very quickly. The importance of critical thinking skills has been recognized for some time. They have been part of the higher cognitive levels of Bloom's taxonomy of learning objectives in education for many years. What has changed? Particularly within information technology is the relative importance of critical thinking skills for long-term career success. Our digital society is inundated with massive amounts of data. Data mining, sophisticated algorithms, and technical innovation are important, but the most valuable asset is an employee who can solve problems. The IT community has become interested in critical thinking skills that can help a person find, organize, analyze, and use the information that he or she needs on the job. Many employers now seek critical thinkers who can locate data, identify important facts, and apply their knowledge in real-world decisions. Many training courses exist for technical skills but developing critical thinking skills is equally important. Performing practice tasks that resemble actual workplace tasks can develop critical thinking skills. Studying systems analysis and design can help because it provides a solid foundation in techniques for developing models, organizing data, and recognizing patterns. Just as with hardware or software skills, formal certification is valuable in the job marketplace, but the greatest value is in learning the skills and using them to achieve career goals. Many instructors find that individual and team-based exercises can strengthen critical thinking skills. Examples include games, puzzles, brainstorming, creative problem-solving, decision tables, working with ethical questions, Boolean logic, Venn diagrams, and using cause-and-effect tools such as Pareto charts, X-Y diagrams, and Fishbone diagrams, all of which are found in this text. Cyber Ethics As computers permeate more and more of our lives, the decisions made by IT professionals can have serious implications. Situations may arise involving ethical considerations that are not easy to resolve. Nevertheless, ethical, social, and legal aspects of IT are topics that today's systems analysts should be prepared to address. In the two scenarios presented in the following question of ethics section, ask yourself what would you do? Where would you draw the line? How much would you be willing to risk doing what you thought was the right thing? The decisions you make could well affect your job and future employment scenario 1, in parenthesis, but there are other situations where the implications can be even more severe scenario 2, in parentheses. Summary System support and security cover the period from the implementation of an information system until the system no longer is used. A systems analyst's primary involvement with an operational system is to manage and solve user support requests. Corrective maintenance includes changes to correct errors. Adaptive maintenance satisfies new system's requirements, and perfective maintenance makes the system more efficient. Adaptive and perfective maintenance changes often are called enhancements. Preventive maintenance is performed to avoid future problems. The typical maintenance process resembles a miniature version of the system's development life cycle. A system request for maintenance work is submitted and evaluated. If it is accepted, the request is prioritized and scheduled for the IT group. The maintenance team then follows a logical progression of investigation, analysis, design, development, testing, and implementation. Corrective maintenance projects occur when a user or an IT staff member reports a problem. Standard maintenance procedures usually are followed for relatively minor errors but work often begins immediately when users report significant errors. In contrast to corrective maintenance, adaptive, perfective, and preventive maintenance projects always follow the organization's standard maintenance procedures. Adaptive maintenance projects occur in response to user requests for improvements to meet changes in the business or operating environments. The IT staff usually initiates perfective maintenance projects to improve performance or maintainability. Automated program restructuring and re-engineering are forms of perfective maintenance. In order to avoid future problems, IT staff perform preventive maintenance, 
which involves analysis of areas where trouble is likely to occur. A maintenance team consists of one or more systems analysts and programmers. Systems analysts need the same talents and abilities for maintenance work as they use when developing a new system. Many IT departments are organized into separate new development and maintenance groups where staff members are rotated from one group to the other. CM is necessary to handle maintenance requests, to manage different versions of the information system, and to distribute documentation changes. Maintenance changes can be implemented as they are completed, or a release methodology can be used in which all non-critical maintenance changes are collected and implemented simultaneously. A release methodology usually is cost-effective and advantageous for users because they do not have to work with a constantly changing system. Systems analysts use functional, allocated, and product baselines as formal reference points to measure system characteristics at a specific time. System performance measurements include response time, bandwidth, throughput, and turnaround time. Capacity management uses those measurements to forecast what is needed to provide future levels of service and support. Also, case tools that include system evaluation and maintenance features can be used during the system's operation, security, and support phase. Security is a vital part of every information system. System security is dependent upon a comprehensive security policy that defines how organizational assets are to be protected and how attacks are to be responded to. Risk management creates a workable security policy by identifying, analyzing, anticipating, and reducing risks to an acceptable level. Because information systems face a wide array of threats and attacks, six separate but interrelated security levels should be analyzed physical security, network security, application security, file security, user security, and procedural security. Physical security concerns the physical environment, including critical equipment located in a computer room, as well as safeguards for servers and desktops throughout the company. Network security involves encryption techniques, as well as private networks and other protective measures, especially where wireless transmissions are concerned. Application security requires an understanding of services, hardening, application permissions, input validation techniques, software patches and updates, and software logs. File security involves the use of encryption and permissions, which can be assigned to individual users or to user groups. User security involves identity management techniques, a comprehensive password protection policy, and awareness of social engineering risks and an effective means of overcoming user resistance. Procedural security involves managerial controls and policies that ensure secure operations. Data backup and recovery issues include backup media, backup schedules, and retention periods, as well as backup designs such as RAID and cloud-based backups. All information systems eventually become obsolete. The end of a system's economic life usually is signaled by rapidly increasing maintenance or operating costs, the availability of new software or hardware, or new requirements that cannot be achieved easily by the existing system. When a certain point is reached, an information system must be replaced, and the entire system's development life cycle begins again. Many IT experts predict intense competition in the future, along with economic, political, and social uncertainty. Facing these challenges, top IT priorities will be the safety and security of corporate operations, environmental concerns, and bottom line TCO. An IT professional should have a strategic career plan that includes long term goals and intermediate milestones. An important element of a personal strategic plan is the acquisition of IT credentials and certifications that document specific knowledge and skills. Many IT industry leaders offer certification. In addition to technical ability, other skills, such as critical thinking skills, also are extremely valuable. Chapter Review Key Terms Acceptance Adaptive Maintenance Administrator Account Allocated Baseline Applications Programmer Archived. Asset. Attack. Automatic update service. Availability. Avoidance. Backup.
Backup media. Backup policy. Bandwidth. Baseline. Benchmark testing. Biometric scanning systems. BIOS level password. Boot level password. Business continuity plan. BCP. Capacity planning. Certification. Change control. Parenthesis. CC. In parenthesis. CIA triangle. Confidentiality. Configuration management. Parenthesis. CM. In parenthesis. Continuous backup. Corrective maintenance. Credentials. Critical risks. Critical thinking skills. Data replication. Database programmer. Denial of service. DOS. Differential backup. Disaster recovery plan. Distributed denial of service. DDoS. Dumpster diving. Encryption. Enhancement. Exploit. Fault management. Fault tolerant. Firewall. Full backup. Functional baseline. Gigabits per second. GBPS. Hardening. Help desk. Hot site. Identity management. Identity theft. IEEE 802.11i. Incremental backup. Integrity. Kilobits per second. KVPS. Keystroke logger. Log. Maintenance activities. Maintenance expenses. Maintenance release. Maintenance release methodology. Maintenance team. Malware. Megabits per second. MVPS. Metrics. Mitigation. Network. Network interface. Network intrusion detection system. NIDS. Offsetting. Operational costs. Operational security. Patch. Perfective maintenance. Permissions. Plain text. Port. Port scans. Power on password. Pretexting. Preventive maintenance. Private key encryption. Private network. Privilege escalation attack. Procedural security. Product baseline. Programmer analyst. Public key encryption, PKE. Redundant array of independent disks, RAID. Recovery. Remote control software. Response time. Retention period. Risk. Risk assessment. Risk control. Risk.